Hey everybody, and welcome back to Linear Algebra Online. So today I want to talk about something called the Rank Theorem, which is honestly one of the big ones um, in Linear Algebra. And um, it's one of these things that we'll actually revisit as the year goes on, um, kind of under different um, settings almost. So there's going to be like a Rank Theorem where we... Um, think of linear transformations, and there's going to be a rank theorem where we just think of a matrix, and you'll see. Um, but um, in order to do that, we need to understand something called free variables. So this was the system that we looked at last time, and if you RREF this, you would get the following. So RREF would give you... Uh, 1, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 0, 0, 1, negative 1, 1, and then a row of 0. Um, and REF will always be unique. Um, REF isn't always unique, but um, this is basically the most reduced version of um, this uh, system. So... Um, we did talk about this also last time. I just wrote down that W then would equal like 2 plus X minus Z. And then we could say that Y is 1 plus Z. Okay. And what I want to do is, so we, I talked briefly about how um, because of the dimension of these planes, which is like a four-dimensional plane, but there's only three of them. Um, it makes sense that you're going to get infinite amount of solutions. It's like when you have two planes in 3D and like two 3D planes in 3D, which is important, um, that that would oftentimes give you a line of intersection, which is infinite amount of points. So we're actually getting a plane of intersection here. And I wanted to show you this a little bit more. So um, this W and Y are what we call leading variables, okay? Um, so these are your two leading variables. Basically, we can define the solution in terms of them, right? Just by moving these parts over. Um, and again, this is kind of implied here as like the equal sign. Um, so um, if we do that, we can basically parameterize our solution and turn it into like a vector kind of form that we might kind of be more familiar with. So the, the way we're going to do is we can say like, um, well, we can just like let uh, x equal like s and uh, z be t, okay? And if we do that, then we can define our solution w, x, y, z as um, something just with s's and t's. So we know w is 2 plus x minus z, which would then be like 2 plus s minus t. And then we know that x is just s, y is 1 plus z, or 1 plus t, and then z is t. Right? And um, if you like unpack this a little bit, so if we kind of um, separate this out, W, X, Y, Z, uh, we have, there's like a point of, um, that's on the solution space that is 2, 0, 1, 0, right? And then if you pull out the stuff with just with S, you would get 1, 1, 0, 0. And then you would get, for t, you get negative 1, 0, 1, 1. So what we're really getting here is a plane, right? This is a vector form for a plane. Um, these are direction vectors for the plane. And this is a point on the plane. Um, but the solution space here is basically um, a four-dimensional hyperplane that acts as the intersection of these three other hyperplanes. Um, that's what's going on. Sometimes it'll kind of hurt your brain to think about all the geometry because we're going to be doing things in such high dimensions. Um, and eventually, 
you sort of just think about it, well, there's this many different print, like things, I guess, that go into this problem. Um, and then we're concerned with how they interact with each other. Um, because this could apply to like a circuit problem. This could apply to like some sort of um, economic modeling problem that could literally represent like all sorts of different variables in different problems. So don't necessarily think that the geometry here is actually always going to help you understand the solution. Um, just we want to make, I want to make sure you know how to take something like this answer and put it into like a kind of parametric vector form that um, you could then like work with. And the last thing I just wanted to find, so we talked about um, these leading variables, um, but the, the reason, so these two, the X and the Z, are the free variables. X and Z are free. And anything that's free, like we can basically parameterize and we can define um, the solution in terms of it. Um, they're the things that are sort of allowed to like, uh, we can use them to like scale in these directions is the idea. Um, they are not like super specific variables. They're free to be just any parameter like S and T. Um, so these guys are leading, these guys free. So really important definition here. Um, the rank of a matrix um, is the number of non-zero rows in its row echelon form, okay? So if you go to like your calculator and do REF, not RREF, um, the first two are actually pretty straightforward because you would just, um, so if you REF, you're gonna actually just flip the matrix around and you get that one, and likewise this one, if you REF it, you basically just flip it around, you get one, two, three, zero, one, two. Um, if you REF this one, then you would get, um, actually, I just did it earlier, so I have it right here. Um, you get a row of zeros there at the bottom. But um, if you just count, literally the number of non-zero rows, in the row echelon form for this one, it's two. This one, it's two. This one's also two. Um, the rank then of those matrices is two. And um, rank ends up being a very important like um, tool to kind of learn something about this system. Um, and you'll see rank show up time and time and time again. But to find it, it's pretty straightforward. You literally just take the REF of the thing and um, count the number of non-zero rows. So this one had one zero row, so its rank was two. Which means that we can talk about this now. So the rank theorem. This is a big one. So, um, so the theorem says, um, let A be a coefficient matrix of a system of linear equations with n variables. If the system is consistent, then the number of free variables equals n minus the rank of that matrix. Okay. Um, so, I think it is best if I show you an example here. So, I just kind of pulled these matrices out of thin air. Um, so, I'm just copying them down. All right, we got that one, and then we got this one. So in this problem um, on the left, uh, there are no free variables um, because so the size of this matrix is, um, it's like a three by three, but there's, or it's three by four, but there's uh, n variables, <laughs> sorry, I lost my words, but the n variables would be the three um, rows basically. So you got X, Y, and Z. Um, this is kind of understood to be the like number column, right? So you've only got three variables in here. So this little equation would literally be three. And then the rank of it is the number of non-zero um, rows, which there's um, three of those, right? And so you get zero. And so this thing um, tells you that there are no like 
variables we can parameterize, basically. You know, here it's very straightforward. Z is 3, Y is 2, X is 7. Um, there's nothing like this problem where I'm defining a variable in terms of other ones. Like these were free um, because I could like parameterize them like that. Um, but in this problem, so this one is actually very analogous to that previous example because here you really do have 3D planes. Um, so you have, you have these, yeah, two planes embedded in 3D and they're going to probably be an infinite amount of intersection points. And so you're going to get some sort of free variable. Um, the solution space would basically be like a line. Um, so here, if I do, um, the amount of variables is still three, right? And then the rank of it would be two, because there's two non-zero rows. And then if you subtract, you get one. And the one free variable would basically be um, this thing right in here, right? If we like went through that, you know, we could say, okay, x equals two minus z, and then y equals two minus three z. And so I could do the th same thing as before. I could let like z equal like t, and I could define the solution space as like a line of intersection. Um, the way I see this is literally like, here's a plane, here's a different plane, and there's some sort of line of intersection between the two. And I could define it with like a vector form to parameterize that um, intersection. So that's a big one. Um, basically, you just want to get to the point where you can kind of visualize when you're going to get these parameters popping up and when you just get like a very straightforward solution with no like parameterization going on. So there's just a um, definition down here that I want to use to actually you prove um, something in a theorem with. And so there's this term hom homogeneous um, or homogeneous. And basically a system is homogeneous like this if the constant term in it is zero. So if you take, uh, as an example, these guys, um, if you think of this as a system, the, they're a homogeneous system because there's no like number here, okay? And if you think about it, if you have no number, you could always get a solution because you could always just take 0, 0, 0 as a solution to a system like that. Now, there might be a lot more, too. You might have infinite amount of solutions or something, um, but for sure, 0, 0 is going to work. 0, 0, 0 is going to work um, because you could just plug that in and kill it. You get 0 and plug it in here and you can kill it and get 0. Um, so that is like a weird little special case for a system where you just know you're always going to get an answer and it leads to this. So this is a notation that you haven't really seen too much. Um, coming out of the proofs, it kind of looks like I'm talking about the divides thing, but um, this is really the notation for augment. So basically you have a matrix A augmented with the zero vector. So you think you should think of this as like a column vector. Um, so basically it's a, it's a homogeneous system of M linear equations. So basically stack things like this together um, and that right column is all zeros. So you've got um, M linear equations, you got M of those, and then you got N variables, okay? And specifically M is less than N. Then it says the system will have infinitely many solutions. And the way you should think about this is basically like this idea. It's really a lot like this example. You have these two equations, so that's the M, and two is less than the three variables that you got in here. And so it makes sense that there should be an intersection, like that would be like infinite like this. You know, if you have another, um, if you had a third plane that maybe came in on this line or something, then you wouldn't maybe get a line of intersection right anymore. You might get just now a point. Um, so when you have two, like planes in 3D, a lot of times you get an infinite amount of solutions. And that's kind of what this is saying. 
but it also guarantees that you even get a solution because of the homogeneous part. Like you, you can definitely um, get a solution because of that part right there. So I actually want to prove this because I think it's kind of a good um, example of a problem that uses like rank theorem and stuff like that. The idea of this one is going to be basically to show that you have a non-zero amount of free variables. And if you have that, then you basically have infinitely many solutions. Because if, as soon as you can parameterize something like this, then you're going to get like a line of intersection. Or if you have like this one, um, you have a plane's worth of intersection. Um, so you you know, both of them are still infinite. So, um, so I'm going to start off and I'm just going to say, um, note that the rank of A has to be less than or equal to M. Um, and that's pretty clear, but I'll just explain. Um, since we have M linear equations, it would be impossible to have more than m non-zero rows, right? I mean, it's just like if you only have three rows, three equations, you're not going to get a rank of four or something like that. It just doesn't make sense. So we know that the rank of A is less than or equal to M. Um, so therefore, we would have that the minus the rank of A would be greater than or equal to negative M, okay? And likewise, if we just add N to both sides, right, we could set up our rank theorem, actually. So if we just add n, um, we get that, right? So we know, um, you know, by the rank theorem, um, this says that the number of free variables is greater than or equal to m minus n minus m. But since m is less than n, we can also say that that has to be greater than zero, right? So um, there exists at least one free variable, and hence we have infinitely many solutions. That'd be it. Um, so, you know, this is. Um, this part right here is just the rank theorem. And that's why I can sub in that, right? We know M is less than N. So if you subtract M from N, it's some positive number, right? And so basically we know there is some sort of thing we can parameterize like that. Um, or maybe we have a few of them like that. And, um, that means we'll get like an infinite amount of solutions. Um, so free variables are very important. You're going to see them constantly throughout the year. Um, basically, they're just these parameters that we um, worked with a ton in, like Calc 3 with, and at the beginning of this year again.